Good morning. Would you stand and join me as we sing this morning? such talented and wonderful musicians. Let's give our musicians a round of applause. Thank you. I just needed just a minute to catch my breath. <laughs> this uh, total of nothing to play with. Yeah. Next lesson a while. Yeah. Um, 
we are so glad to have you this morning. We're excited that you chose to worship with us this morning. We hope that you are blessed by the time that you spend with us, and we hope that you enjoy and are blessed now as the class shows us what she is. Your presence. 
Amen. Thank you, choir. And I do want to just second what Brother Jeff said about our music ministry. We're so grateful for for their their gifting and how they they bless us. And and so thank you, choir. And also uh, thank you, Jeff and Brother Ricky. I don't I don't thank you guys enough for for all that you do for us and your willingness to to let God use you and and, and by leading us in music ministry. So thank you guys. You're doing a you're doing a great uh, job. Well, I, I want to say uh, it's so good to be here this morning. Um, it, it's good to see each and every one of you. It's 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 just a it's just a, a a blessing to be a part of the family of God, and to be able to worship in His uh, His house. And for our guest, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I do want to say a special welcome, brother brother Larry, Miss Carolyn, have their daughter Miss Jenny, and her husband brother Boyd, up from from sunny Port St. Joe. Uh, so thank you for being with us, and it's always a joy to have you with us. I'm going to ask brother Larry, w- would you and brother Lee, and where is Glenn? Glenn, if y'all would go ahead and make your way to the front, we're going to go ahead and pray for you guys. Brother Boyd, are you going on the trip as well? Not this time, okay. Um, But in a few moments, I just want us to have a special time of prayer for these guys as they're going to be leaving in a couple weeks to go on their trip down to um, to Guyana. You guys can go ahead and be seated. I got a couple things I want to do before we pray. Um, But we are looking forward to to your trip and hearing about all that God's going to do through you. Um, Church family, I I wanted to read uh, something to you. Many of you will remember uh, for for about a a year plus, there was a gentleman, he sat in the very back of the church. His his name was Cleve Whitaker. He was a a quiet uh, guy, but was faithful to come. And uh, and, and God has moved uh, Brother Cleve out to Texas uh, where he is now working out there, but he sent a card, he sent it to his Sunday school class, but I wanted to read this to the church family. Um, I, I just want to say before I read the card, thank you church family for being the the friendly, uh, welcoming church that you are. You never know what kind of impact uh, you're having on people, and you never know the, the type of people that God sends to us, and so just listen to what uh, uh, Brother Cleve said he said um, he says all because of you sunday morning quickly became my absolute favorite part of the week how i look forward to seeing you all and learning more about our wonderful god no doubt he put you in my life to enhance my sanctification trusting that i I knew i was going to hear the truth from pastor michael mark and everyone in our class has meant more to me than i can describe Though I am leaving, know that you all will remain in my heart in prayers. Sadness overwhelms me, but I have great confidence that our Lord and Savior is in control of my life. I never got around to becoming an official church member. However, I know we are all members together in his church. If I happen not to see you again, we will meet again in glory. Continue teaching the truth and loving one another. I love you all, your friend, Cleve Whitaker. And what a blessing, and, and, and that's just a testimony of how God is at work here at First Baptist Church, and that is so exciting. Well, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to read um, from the book of Romans, as we've been doing on Sunday mornings, Romans chapter 15, starting in verse, verse 14. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Iconium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, 
not where Christ has already been named, least I on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him who will see, and those who have never heard will understand. And so today as we come to our time of prayer, we want to pray for Brother Larry and Glenn and Lee as they're going to be going to Guyana. No doubt, guys, you're going to be ministering to believers down there, to pastors. Um, but in God's providence, no doubt, he's going to put some people in your life that need to hear the gospel. And so, church family, let's, uh, let's pray for these, these men. If some of you want to come and just put your hands on these guys as we uh, pray, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, we just want to pray for, for their trip. So. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the gospel. It is the hope on which we stand, and we thank you that not only are we saved as believers by grace, through faith in the gospel message, we are given the wonderful privilege of being able to go out as your ambassadors to, to preach the gospel. Lord, I, I pray for Larry and Glenn and Lee. Lord, I, I pray for them as they embark on this trip that you've called them to we pray for their safety we pray for them to have wisdom and discernment may they be a source of blessing and encouragement to the church in Guyana but Lord may they also be the light to many who are in Guyana who have yet to hear the wonderful news of Jesus Christ Lord we look forward to hearing about all the amazing things that you're going to do through this trip Lord today as we come as your body as your church to worship you we pray that our hearts would be in tuned to all that is, that is done in this place. I pray, Holy Spirit, if there is, is one here today who's never been saved, I pray that you would, you would save them today as only you can. Lord, we cast our burdens at your feet. Use each of us for your glory. We love you, we thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Psalms 86, verses 8 through 13 says, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite, unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and when I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. my 
Our children are making their way to Children's Church. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to be in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. That's okay. I understand how that works. Mark chapter 5. And we are going to be in... uh, Verses 21 through 43. You know, I thought I would start off with a riddle um, just to get us, you know, focused for the the message. You know, Solomon gave some riddles. And um, I want to give, or excuse me, I said Solomon, Samson. Samson gave some riddles. So I want to see where you're at this morning. See if you're on top of your game. All right, here's the riddle. Everyone has them. Some have had more than others. The older we get, the less we want them. But until we die, they are unstoppable. What are they? Birthdays. Birthdays. Unstoppable. Today, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about something else that's unstoppable in our, our title for today's message is Unstoppable Faith. Unstoppable Faith. We continue in our study through the book of Mark. And of course, the, the focus of Mark's gospel is on the life and ministry of Jesus. And the, the whole aim, according to Mark 1, 1, is to point us to the exact identity of exactly who Jesus Christ is. He is the Son of God. And over the past few weeks, we have seen Jesus' power and His authority displayed. We see that uh, Jesus, as the Son of God, had power over creation as He calmed the storm. Last week, we, we saw that Jesus had power and authority over Satan in chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And today, as we look at a story that's really two stories sandwiched into one, we find that Jesus, as the Son of God, had power and authority over two other areas, sickness and death. And this story, as we're talking about unstoppable faith, it involves two people who demonstrated unstoppable faith. They come from two opposite spectrums. Uh, One is a man, one's a woman, one was wealthy, one we find was financially destitute. One was very much respected while the other was rejected. One was honored, the other was ashamed. One was in charge of the synagogue while the other was excommunicated from the synagogue. One was, uh, had a, a daughter of 12 while the other one had a disease, a debilitating disease for 12 years. And so while we find two opposite people, each of them displays unstoppable faith. One of my favorite little books in the Old Testament is the book of Habakkuk. And Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 says, The righteous shall live by his faith. We know that as God's people, we, we start out our salvation journey by faith. Faith trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So we, we start out by faith, but then as we walk through the Christian life, we are to, to live by faith. We are to be grounded in faith. Now, 
it's important for us to understand that when we talk about faith, it's not that we have faith in faith in and of itself, but we have faith in, in, in who Christ is. And so because we know that Christ has all power and has all authority, we too can live a victorious Christian life by having an unstoppable faith. Now, to have unstoppable faith as a believer, it, it, it means that you refuse to let anything keep you from, from trusting in the Almighty God. It, it means that you, to have unstoppable faith, means that you, you trust in the Lord no matter what. It's unstoppable. This is so important to understand because I think if we were all to be honest this morning, we would have to say that our flesh desires an easy path. We, we want things to go smoothly. We don't like difficult. We don't like hardship. But reality tells us that because we live in this, this fallen world, we're all going to face rocky moments in our journey. And, and sometimes there's, there's times in our faith walk that we get to a place where we almost become overwhelmed. And, and we say to ourselves, I can't take this anymore. I, I don't know if I can go any further. And, and so that's why this lesson that we have today is so important. We see an illustration, again, of two different people, very much different, but yet they both persevered through having an unstoppable faith. So as we look at this story, again, it's one story, really two stories sandwiched into one, and we, we learn further about exactly who Jesus is, that he truly is the Son of God. We see that he has power and authority over sickness and death. We, we look at these two individuals, we learn about unstoppable faith, and what I want to do is I'm going to take our text, and, and I've divided it into three different sections. We see three different scenes in this, in this story, and we'll read the text as we, as we go along. So the first scene is in verses 21 through 23, and what do we find in this first scene? We see Jesus responds to a desperate father. Jesus responds to a desperate father. So Picking up in verse 21, it says, And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jarius by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. So here we see Jesus responds to a desperate father. Now, last week we saw where Jesus had crossed over the Sea of Galilee. They come to the, to the shores of the Gadarenes. There is the demoniac there. The demoniac uh, was unshackled from his, his bondage. Now we see Jesus has crossed back over to Capernaum. And when he gets there, there is a welcoming committee waiting for him. Jesus' popularity is, is growing by the moment. People are talking about Jesus, all that he is, is doing. And so here is this large crowd of people waiting for him to, to return. They don't have presents, welcoming back presents, waiting for Jesus, but instead they have problems, all kinds of problems that they want Jesus to fix. We, we saw that sadly the, the people of the Gadarenes in that region, after Jesus had freed the demoniac and 2,000 pigs rushed into the sea and they all went to hog heaven. Y'all remember that? Um, <laughs> the, the, many of the people in the Gadarenes, they want Jesus gone. They wanted him to leave. Now we see these people, they're glad that Jesus is back. Because again, they have issues, they have problems. They're, they're in a rough spot in their life and they want it to be gone. And so they're all coming to Jesus with all these problems. But there is one man, a desperate 
father. He's desperate. And who is this man? Well, the text tells us that his name is Jarius. He's one of the rulers of the local synagogue. Now, clearly this man is desperate. Our text indicates this. We, we see that his posture proved his desperation. You see that in verse 23. Look at your Bibles. Verse 23. Here is this man. And it says that he, verse 22, he falls at Jesus' feet and begs him earnestly. My little daughter is at the point of, of death. So his very posture, this is a posture not of pride. This is a posture of humility. Here's a ruler, but he's on his knees and he's begging, falling at the feet of Jesus. Now in this culture, grown men certainly, they, they didn't do this. They didn't fall at their feet or fall on their knees at the feet of another man. And especially... One like Jarius, who was, he was a leader in this community. He was a leader of the local synagogue. His responsibility would have been taking care of the operation of, of the synagogue. Um, he probably, more than likely, was very, very closely connected to the religious establishment of the day, who, by the way, is growing in their hatred and opposition towards Jesus. So because of this man's title, because of his position, he knows what is at stake here. He knows the expectation that is put on him by the religious establishment that again is not receiving Jesus, but none of that stops him. He falls at the feet of Jesus expressing, expressing deep reverence and respect for Jesus. Well, not only did his posture prove his desperation, but he had a particular problem that provoked his desperation. What was that problem? Well, again, he has a little girl. She's 12 years old, and she is at the point of death. Luke's gospel tells us in chapter 8 that this was his only daughter. Again, she's, she's 12 years old. Luke informs us of that. She's 12 years old, and she's dying. Now, dads, especially those of us who had little girls, put yourself in this father's shoes. Here is your, here is your little girl. She's dying. You've tried everything possible to get her help. Nothing is helping her. You're willing to do anything and everything to get your daughter help. I cannot imagine the, the desperation that this father faced. His little girl is, is dying. And so he comes to the end of himself. His, his power, his prestige, his influence, his money... None of that mattered at this point. The only thing that mattered was his faith. His faith would not be stopped. This man had probably seen Jesus perform miracles. He had heard about the miracles of Jesus. And so by faith, he reaches out to the one who could help him, Jesus. So, so this is the first scene. Jesus responds to a desperate father. Now let's pick up. In verses 24 through 34, where we come to our second scene, and we see Jesus heals a diseased woman. Jesus heals a diseased woman. Verse 24, and he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse and she heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment for she said if I touch even his garments I will be made well and immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease and Jesus perceived in himself that power had gone out from him and immediately turned about in the crowd and said who touched my garments 
And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing against you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, be healed of your disease. So here we find Jesus heals a diseased woman. All right, so here's Jarius. Here's this desperate father. His, his little girl is at the brink of death. He finally reaches Jesus. He tells Jesus his, his problem. He, he convinces Jesus to come with him. Now, remember, Jesus could have spoken a word, right? But for some reason, he... He chooses to go with Jarius. They're heading on their way. Just imagine the, the anxiety in Jarius's heart. He's so anxious for them to get there. Jarius needed Jesus. But we meet somebody else who needed Jesus as well. This diseased woman. This, this woman who's, who she too is desperate and in need of Jesus. And this woman... You know, for the past 12 years, we, we assume Jarius had 12 years of joy as he, as he watched his little girl grow up into this little girl. But then here's this, tw- this, this woman, and for the past 12 years, she's been in misery. No doubt, she's filled with physical distress. Verse 25 tells us that she had some kind of disease, probably some kind of uterine hemorrhage of some sort, for 12 years. Financially, she's she's completely depleted. Verse 26 tells us that she had spent all that she had on all kinds of different physicians, and none of them could help her. Um, Imagine how distressed she was uh, emotionally. I mean, the harder she tried... The more money she spent, the worse that she got. And so you can just imagine the the mental, the emotional strain, the, the depression, the anxiety that overwhelmed this woman. Spiritually, she's miserable. According to the law, Leviticus 25, we, we won't read that. But because of this woman's condition, she would have been considered unclean. Very much like a leper. Therefore, she was ceremonially unclean. She would have been barred from the temple in Jerusalem. She would have been barred from the local synagogue. So she has this stigmatism that's always hanging over her head that she is unclean. She is unworthy. And not only that, she's socially miserable as well because due to her uncleanness, she would have had to suffer alone being isolated from others, so very little interaction, very little physical contact with, if she was married, her husband and her her family and, and friends. So here's a desperate woman, here is a distressed woman, but just like Jarius, she proves here that she had an unstoppable faith. Nothing would keep her from getting to Jesus. And we see the text tells us that she had heard about Jesus too. Just put yourself in this lady's feet. Here you are. You you don't live in the day in which we live, in which we have all the medical technology that we have. Besides that, maybe, you know, forget about it. She had some medical uh, interaction, with, but they couldn't do anything for her. She's considered unclean, she's suffering alone, but yet she hears about this one named Jesus. She had heard about him raising the dead, healing the blind. She probably heard about the the paralytic that was lowered down uh, there in Capernaum. And so she says to herself, if I can just get to this man named Jesus. But now, there's a few issues here. Number one, she's a woman. So, you know, in that culture, a woman just doesn't go up to a teacher. Uh, She's, again, she's unclean. And then there's this huge crowd of people, this great separation. She could very easily convince herself that while Jesus was the answer, no way he was the answer for her because she had all these obstacles in her way, but yet she refuses to get up or give up. 
And, and, and so as we, as we follow the narrative, here comes Jesus, this big crowd of people, uh, and, and she says to herself, if I can just touch his garment, she's going to go up behind him and just kind of in secret touch his garment. Perhaps her theology is a little messed up and she believed in some superstition. And so she just thinks, okay, the power is in his clothing. And so if I just touch his his clothing, and so she desperately pushes her way through the crowd. She's violating all the, the, the understood conditions. The, the right thing would have, for her to have been would not to have been in this crowd. She would have separated herself from this crowd because of her uncleanness, but instead she comes pushing her way through, and she comes up behind him, and she just touches the tip of his garment. Again, no crowd, no barrier would stop her from getting to Jesus. And so by faith, we, we see that she's, she's healed. It, it, it says um, there in verse 29, and immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that was she was healed of her disease. Again, there's no therapy here. There's no, she's put on a six-month recovery plan. Immediately, the blood dries up and she senses it, senses it in her body that she had been healed. Now, there's nothing magical about his clothes. But it was her, her unstoppable faith in Christ that unleashed the power of God that ultimately brought her healing. But, she's thinking, okay, I'm going to have a kind of a, a secret encounter with Jesus. He doesn't even know, has to know that, that, that I even touched him. She's thinking she's going to touch his garment. She's going to heal. She's going to be healed, and then she's going to go her way. But Jesus is not going to let her have a secret encounter with him. So we see in verse 30, And Jesus, he perceives in himself that power had left his body. And he turns around to the crowd and he says, who touched me? And the disciples. Uh, us guys, we're going through on Sunday evenings, 12 ordinary men. And we're, we're learning about how those guys were so ordinary. So dumb, so dense at times. That's why we can all relate to them so well. And they're like, Jesus, what are you talking about? I mean, Jesus... Do you not understand? Do you not see that there's all kinds of people bumping up against you? And you're going to ask who, who's touched you? Now, Jesus is not looking for an answer. He knows who touched her. In fact, this was a divine appointment that was set before the foundation of the world. Jesus knew this woman. And he turns around and he says, who touched me? What is he doing here? He's drawing this woman out for a couple different reasons. Number one, he wants publicly declared for this woman that she's been healed so that she can now be reintroduced into society. That stigmatism is going to be taken off of her. So, so he, he, he draws her out He's going to save her from this public dis disgrace, but there's something far more important that Jesus is doing here. Her greatest need was not her physical healing. Her greatest need was to be saved spiritually. And, and so she is drawn out so that she would come face to face with Him in order that she may come to know Him personally. And so the text says that she, she comes full of fear and trembling. Why is she full of fear and, and trembling? Well, number one, there's this overwhelming realization she's in the presence of God. Only God could do this. But also, how is Jesus going to react to her? Is she going to be shunned again? Because she, she violated 
those cultural understandings because here's a woman and she's unclean and she just touched him? Is she going to be rebuked? Is she going to be re rejected? And so she comes and she falls at the feet of Jesus. And, and, I, and I like what it, it says. She, she told him the whole truth. This is a beautiful scene. She, she confesses publicly her condition. She confesses her, her initial plan that she's just going to sneak up behind him. She, she, she then declares how Jesus had immediately healed her. And then, and then Jesus' response, verse 34, and Jesus said to her, he doesn't rebuke her. He doesn't shun her. But he says, daughter, don't miss that. The story starts out, she's a woman. She's just an unclean woman. Now she's a daughter. She's a daughter of the king. Daughter, your faith has made you well. That's the Greek word sozo. Your faith has literally saved you. So yeah, she's healed physically, but, but there's a, an encounter here that she has with her Savior, and so she is, she is saved from her, from her sin. So, so she goes from a woman full of despair to a daughter full of hope. So, so we conclude, as we move through the text, verse 35 through 43, the third scene, Jesus raises a dead child. Jesus raises a dead child. Verse 35, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But over hearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But clearly, they were insincere in their mourning. They go from weeping to, to laughing to mocking at Jesus. But he put them all outside and took the, fa the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. So now we go back to Jarius. Here's this desperate father. Now, can you imagine the anxiety, the frustration that is in Jarius' heart? He finally gets to Jesus. He tells Jesus his little girl is dying. They got to hurry and get to, to his house. Jesus agrees. They're on their way, and then there is this interruption. Jesus stops, and he has this conversation with this, this woman. And, and, and if, if I'm Jarius, I'm frustrated. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm really struggling because I'm thinking, yeah, I know this woman needs you, Jesus, but do you not understand? We got to get going. I do not have time for this. But Jesus knew what he was doing. By helping this lady, ultimately, he's helping to build Jarius' faith because of what Jarius is about to encounter when they come to Jarius' home. And so finally, they get to Jarius' home and he receives a message. Jarius receives a message here in, the, in verse 35. It's a disappointing message. Your daughter is dead. This is a message of death. This is a message that no daddy wants to hear about their daughter. They go on to say, don't bother the teacher anymore. There's, there's no use Start making the, the, the funeral arrangements. And Jarius, perhaps, he's thinking, if we had just gotten here sooner. 
if we hadn't had this interruption, maybe there's even resent, anger towards this woman. But then he's given a miracle in verses 36 through 43. They, they go into the house. Jesus takes the parents and he takes the inner three, Peter, James, and John. And, and they go to where the little girl is at. And here are these, these mourners. Back in those days, you would, you would pay people to come and mourn for you. And, and this was a business, by the way. And, and so like vultures, these mourners had heard about this sick little girl, and so they're already there. They're handing out business cards. And, and, and there they are mourning, and then they hear the news, and, and, and so they... They're, they're having this conversation with Jesus, and, and Jesus says to them, she's not dead, but, but she's just sleeping, and, and they immediately begin to laugh. They go from crying to laughing, and I, like, and I like this. Jesus puts them all outside. Sometimes we paint a picture of Jesus that he's this kind of like weak, meek, wimpish, you know, save your feet. No, he puts them all outside with a spoken word. He puts them outside. And he goes upstairs. He takes the little girl by the hand. He says, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately this little girl arises from the death bed. This is a miracle. And, and, and don't miss this, church. If you're saved, you see it. This is a picture of the miracle of salvation. The, the Bible says that before we came to Christ, we weren't just kind of bad. We weren't just kind of messed up. The Bible, according to Ephesians 2.1, says that we were completely dead spiritually in our sins. We had no spiritual life in us whatsoever we couldn't even wiggle our little toe at God spiritually blind spiritually dead but then we were made alive through the power of the Holy Spirit we were raised from spiritual deadness to spiritual life and just like this little girl, immediately she's, she's dead. And when she's healed, she opens her eyes immediately in the presence of Jesus. I believe the first face she saw was Jesus. And guess what? If you're saved today, when you die, immediately when you open your eyes in death, the first face you're going to see is Jesus. You're going to be awakened in the presence of Jesus. And, and so Jarius, that delay was good for him. He got more than what he imagined. He comes to Jesus. He's just hoping that Jesus would heal his daughter. But Jesus does something far greater. He raises his little girl up from the grave. So, so we, we see Jesus raises a dead child. So we've looked at the story. We, we see again that Mark accomplishes his, his intent by this gospel. He shows that Jesus is the Son of God. He shows that Jesus had power and authority over not only nature and not only over Satan, but we see that Jesus had power and authority over disease and death. And then we see illustrated this unstoppable faith. And because Jesus is the same today, Jesus never changes we too can have unstoppable faith when our, our faith is anchored in Him. Quickly, when you think about people who have unstoppable faith, there, there's several things we see illustrated that, that when we have unstoppable faith, people who have unstoppable faith, they refuse to let their pride hinder their faith. Pride says, I'm too good to need God. Pride says, I'm too religious to need, to need God. I mean, I've been a member of First Baptist Church for how long? I've been baptized. I'm a good, moral person. Pride says, I'm too healthy to need God. Pride says, I'm too wealthy to need God. But faith that is, that is unhindered says, I need God. He's my only hope. 
people with unstoppable faith, they don't let pride hinder their faith. They don't let problems hinder their faith. Where are you at today? What problem do you have in your life that the world would say there's no answer to? But unstoppable faith says that while the world has no answers for my problems, I know the one who does. Unstoppable faith, it won't let pain hinder hinder faith. You, You know, when we look at Jarius... Yeah, he has his situation with his little girl, but, but he faced the pain of disappointment. You know, have you found that disappointment is very painful? When things don't work out the way that you had hoped that they would work out. I mean, you've been praying about something for so long, and it doesn't work out the way that you had planned on it working out. That's Jarius. Your daughter's dead. What pain filled his heart? The pain of defeat. But people who have unstoppable faith, they don't allow pain to enter their faith. They also don't allow people to hinder their faith. Jarius, here's these people, they're saying things to him. What's the use? Your your daughter's dead. Leave the teacher alone. Go make the funeral plans. And, And you know, church, so many people let what others do or what others say hinder their faith. Oh, the the number of people who are no longer active in church, they're no longer living for God because they've allowed people to hinder their faith. Do you know people like that? Maybe, Maybe you've been that person. Somebody, somebody did something that discouraged your faith, or maybe they didn't do something that they should have done. Or there was that person and they, they said something about you, or they said something to you, and it's discouraged your faith. But people with unstoppable faith, they don't let people hinder their faith. And finally, people who have unstoppable faith... They refuse to let pauses hinder their faith. What are pauses? They're delays. We don't like to wait, do we? We we want things instantaneous. We want the fastest iPhone, right? We we want fast food. We, We we. this new generation that's coming up, they want success now. They want what their parents had to work for for 30, 40 years. They want that now. We, we don't like to wait. Lord, why? Why have you not done something? Lord, have you forgotten about me? But let us remember that oftentimes God gives us delays because he has a bigger blessing planned for us. He's going to do something that we can't see. We can't see him orchestrating. But he's in control over those delays. And when he works, when we continue to trust him, he does things that we would never dream. Just like with Jarius. So, as we've talked about unstoppable faith. Two words of application and then we're we're finished. Number one, get honest and admit you can't fix your problems. Get honest and admit you can't fix your problems. You've tried everything. Am I the only one, but I like to try to fix my problems. Um, and, And so we try all kinds of things. Well, if I can just do this, if I can just do that, but then nothing seems to, cor- to, to work. Nothing seems to come together. The quicker you and I come to, to recognize that we cannot fix our problems, the one step closer 
we are to getting the true help that we need. Because here's the reality. As long as we think we can fix our problems, we're not going to turn in desperation to the Lord. You cannot fix the circumstances of your life. And I'm not saying that we just sit on the couch and say, well, I have faith and Jesus is going to fix everything. Yes, there are certain things that we must do. But at the end of the day, He is the only one that can ultimately fix our problems. We can't fix our children. We can't fix our spouse. We can't change anybody. We have to acknowledge, we have to admit that we can't fix our problems. And number two, give up and give Jesus your problems. That's what faith is. It's it's reaching out to Jesus. When we get to that place of humility, God gives grace to the humble. When we reach that place of humility and we say, Lord, I can't, but I believe that you can. You're, You're the answer. And faith is just being desperate enough to recognize that only Jesus can help you and believing that he can. And and understand, this is important, church, faith is not saying, okay, I have a plan, Jesus. I'm going to tell you what to do, and I have enough faith that you can do that, so therefore you're going to do it exactly how I say. That's not faith. We don't declare anything. You know, I'm going to speak it, and and then I'm going to hold God's hand, and he's going to be forced to do what I tell him to do. No, true faith is saying, Lord, I have this problem. I give it over to you. I roll it over to you, and I trust that you will handle it how you want and when you want. That's unstoppable faith. So this morning, as we come to our our time of of response, maybe this morning you you have a problem. You have an issue. And you're frustrated, you're discouraged, you're disappointed. Admit you can't fix your problems. Only Jesus can fix your problems. Just like the the woman, reach out. Reach out and touch him. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, for this beautiful picture that we have of unstoppable faith. Uh, Lord, we we thank you for this father, his desperation. It was his desperation that drove him to Jesus ultimately. And then we see this woman who was rejected. She was shunned. She was not wanted. But yet she believed in her heart that you were what she needed. And you didn't rebuke her. You didn't shun her. You received her. And you transformed her. Yes, physically, but even more importantly, you transformed her spiritually. And one day... When we get to heaven, perhaps we'll be able to sit down with this lady and she can tell us firsthand about her encounter with Jesus. Lord, work in our midst today. May your spirit have liberty to move in our hearts. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to invite you to stand as we respond to God's word this morning. Only trust him. You know, as I read this story, I still can't get past that little phrase where it says that she told him the whole truth. You'll never be able to get right with the Lord. You'll never be able to have a relationship with the Lord until you too get to that place where you tell him the whole truth. Tell him. You're not going to inform him, but acknowledge your need for him. Confess to him that you need him. Maybe today, as we, as we respond, maybe your greatest need is you need to receive Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. You come. Trust in Jesus. Maybe you want to come to the altar. Is there something in your life? There's somebody in your life that you're praying for and you just want to pour your heart out. Feel the liberty to do whatever you need to do as we sing. Come every soul by sin oppressed there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust him now he will 
save you, he will save you, he will save you now, for Jesus shed his precious blood, Tim only, Tim only trust him now, he will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Amen, amen, God is good and There's no problem too big for our Lord to handle. Well, some quick announcements. I just want to remind everybody tonight, we're excited. We're having our chili cook-off, 6 o'clock. You say, well, what if I'm not bringing chili? Can I still come? Absolutely. We want you to come. You will be blessed. It'll be a good time, and uh, and I'm looking forward to, to sampling all the different entries. We have about 13, 14 entries, so come with an appetite. Uh, just to clarify our Bible studies, um, tonight our men are still going to meet. We're going to meet at 5 o'clock. The ladies, are they're, they're not going to meet tonight. Uh, but now, ladies, if you would like to come and you would like to help set up, certainly you, you are allowed, um, more than welcome to, to uh, do that. Lottie Moon, does anybody remember what our goal was for Lottie Moon this year? $10,000. Of course, Lottie Moon goes to support our Southern Baptist missionaries, and I'm so excited to tell you that not only did we meet our, our goal, but we exceeded our goal. You gave $10,373.55 to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. So thank you so much, um, and I know that God's going to use that to reach people with the, with the uh, gospel. Two words of clarification Number one, Wednesday evening. Um, We're not having a Wednesday night meal just this Wednesday. Um, Mike and Michelle, thank you so much. I cannot thank you both enough. And for others who help serve in the kitchen, y'all have been doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Um, But because of of winter break at the school, we're not going to be having a meal. However, we still will be having children and youth activities and a, a prayer time at 6.30. So just just know that. And then finally, Vacation Bible School will be here before we know it. We have a sign-up sheet in the church office if you would like to volunteer for Vacation Bible School. Well, it's been a good day in the house of the Lord. So grateful to see each and every one of you come back tonight as we fellowship around some chili. And there's some hot competition, no pun intended. Um, so... <laughs> I'm excited. Brother Jeff is our Deacon of the Week. Would you mind closing us in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, and we thank you this word that, um, for this word that you've given us this morning, Father, through your messenger. And we pray that as we um, have heard of these, um, this, la- this young lady and this uh, man of unstoppable faith, Father, that we would learn to have that same unstoppable faith, Father, and that we know that the only way that we can truly grow in you, Father, is to be completely honest. Not tell our truth, Father, but tell the truth which we've shared with you and come to know you. And that the only way that we can know truly about ourselves is to know more about you and to draw closer to you. All these things we ask in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen.